Association. Uh, Dr. Thomas Koken, did I get it right? Pretty close. That means I didn't get it right. I know, I know that's, you're being kind. Is the George Maverick Bunker Professor of Management at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Ms. Dalmia. Ah, that's what I was going to say. Is a senior analyst at the Reason Foundation. Thank you all for being here. As you, uh, if you were here earlier, we uh, typically, um, or the custom of the committee is to swear everyone in. So if you please stand, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to, uh, uh, or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show everyone answered in the affirmative. Let's go right down the list. Mr. Eikenson, you are up first. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich, and members of the subcommittee. I am Dan Eikenson, Associate Director of the Herbert A. Stiefel Center for Trade Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. Uh, since 2009, I have followed closely the events surrounding the auto company bailouts and bankruptcies, and I am grateful for the opportunity to share my concerns regarding the lasting implications of the GM bailout. The views expressed today are my own uh, and should not be construed as representing any official positions of the Cato Institute. With help from some pundits and, and various media outlets, the administration is pitching the narrative that the auto bailouts were successful. The evidence in support of that conclusion seems to be limited to the fact that GM has been profitable over the last five quarters and that Chrysler has repaid much of its debt to the U.S. Treasury. But calling the bailout successful is to whitewash, one, the diversion of funds from the Troubled Asset Relief Program for, from, by two administrations for purposes unauthorized by Congress, two, the looting and redistribution of claims against GM's and Chrysler's assets from shareholders and debt holders to pensioners, Three, the unprecedented encroachment by the executive branch into the finest details of the bankruptcy process to orchestrate what bankruptcy law experts describe as sham sales. Four, the cost of denying Ford and the other more deserving automakers the spoils of competition. Five, the costs of insulating irresponsible actors such as the United Auto Workers from the outcomes of an apolitical political bankruptcy proceeding. Six, the diminution of U.S. moral authority to counsel foreign governments against similar market interventions, and seven, the lingering uncertainty about the direction of policy under the current administration that pervades the business environment to this very day. I think if the President wants to take credit for saving the auto industry, he should also take responsibility for the regime uncertainty that has persisted during his administration since much, since much of that uncertainty, which is manifest in weak business investment and hiring, flows from lessons learned from the auto intervention. Acceptance of the administration's pronouncement of auto bailout success demands profound gullibility or willful ignorance. If proper judgment is to be passed, then all of the bailout's costs and benefits must be considered. Otherwise, calling the bailout a success is like applauding the recovery of a drunken driver after an accident while ignoring the condition of the family he severely maimed. The lasting impl implications of the bailout will depend on whether or not Americans ultimately accept the narrative that the bailout was a success. If it is considered a success, the threshold for interventions will have been lowered, and Americans will have to judge even more bailouts in the future. If it is considered a failure, as it should be, the lasting implications will be less destructive because the threshold that tempts interventionists will be higher. On that score, contrary to what the administration would have the public believe, gauging the success of the GM bailout requires consideration of more than just the ratio of finances recouped over financial outlays. There are numerous other costs that don't factor into that equation. If the bailout is considered a success, some of the lasting implications likely will include the following. One, an increase in government interventions and bailouts of politically important entities. Two, fear-mongering will be considered an effective technique to stifle debate and enable a stampede toward the politically expedient outcomes. Three, Americans will be more willing to extend powers without serious objection to the executive branch that we would not extend in the absence of a perceived crisis. Four, a greater diversion of productive assets is likely to occur, uh, from productive assets to, to political ends, such as resources for research and development and engineering, to lobbying and lawyering. Five, a greater uncertainty to the business climate, as the rule of law is weakened and higher risk premiums are assigned to U.S. economic activity. Less prudent decision-making from Ford Motor Company, for example, knowing that it has banked its bailout. A greater push for the administration for a comprehensive national industrial policy and less aversion to subsidization of, of chosen industries abroad. Uh, the objection to the auto ballot was not that the Federal Government wouldn't be able to marshal adequate resources to help GM. The most serious concerns were about the consequences of that intervention, the undermining of the rule of law, the property confiscations, the politically driven decisions, and the distortions of market signals. Any verdict on the auto ballot must take these crucial considerations into account. 
GM's recent profits speak only to the fact that politicians committed more than $50 billion to the task of subsidizing and reconfiguring GM. With debts expunged, cash infused, inefficiencies severed, ownership reconstituted, sales rebates underwritten and political obstacles steamrolled, all in the midst of a recovery in U.S. auto demand, only the most incompetent operations could fail to make profits. But taxpayers are still short a minimum of 10 to $20 billion, depending on the price uh, that the government's 500 million shares of GM uh, will fetch. That is a lot of public money in the balance. Uh, nevertheless, the administration should divest as soon as possible without regard to the stock price. Keeping the government's tentacles around a large firm and an important industry will keep the door open wider to industrial policy and will deter market-driven decisions uh, throughout the industry, possibly keeping the brakes on the recovery. Yes, there will be a significant loss to taxpayers, but the right lesson to learn from this chapter in history is that government interventions carry real economic costs, only some of which are readily measurable. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Atkinson. We appreciate the great points you made in your, your testimony. Um, again, just so you know, your, obviously your testimony will be part of the record. We will get that to each member so they can hear your, 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 good, um, your good words. Uh, I do have to leave here in a couple minutes. I'm, I want to preside for Mr. Gump's testimony, and then uh, Congressman Kelly will take over for our last two uh, witnesses. Mr. Gump, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to represent the thousands of Delphi retirees who were, in fact, mistreated by the Obama administration during its unprecedented intervention in the auto industry, particularly in respect to the remaking of General Motors. I know you have had an opportunity to read my uh, written testimony, so I will summarize quickly. And I want to start off by saying that I am not a lawyer. I am an engineer, uh, and I will do the best I can with some of this. Uh, but you have to understand that I may not be able to get all of it right. From the time candidate Obama said in May of 2008 that if a company goes bankrupt, then workers need to be our top priority, not an afterthought, to the weekly radio address by Vice President Biden just a few weeks ago when he said, we are focused on making sure that if you work hard, play by the rules, you will be able to get ahead, put your kids through college, and retire with dignity and security. We have learned that talk is cheap in this town, and action to determine, and determination to do what is right is hard to come by. In this situation, a purposeful decision was made to create a government that was commercially minded instead of being bound by the precepts of our Constitution, such as due process and equal protection. Decisions were discriminatory and politically motivated that were made behind closed doors, out of sight of any supervisory board or committee, and for the last two years, the records of those decisions have been protected fierce and fiercely guarded by both the PBGC and the Treasury. The only explanation so far was is that there was no commercial necessity to do anything for those people. In reality, it was done for the expediency of GM's bankruptcy exit, not for the benefit of the people of the country. A quick chronology would include the fact that GM was forced into Chapter 11 bankruptcy by the administration. Delphi, a GM spinoff, had already been in bankruptcy for several years but remained a major supplier to GM and so was needed in order for GM to be able to survive. Because Delphi had not made contributions to their pension plans, the PBGC had placed liens on Delphi's foreign assets, which made it impossible for Delphi to sell those assets. So the Treasury cut a deal with GM, the PBGC, and Delphi, such that the PBGC gave up their liens in favor of an equity position in New Delphi, a one-time $70 million payment from GM, and a $3 billion unsecured claim. Thus, GM could keep their major supplier, but the participants in the pension plans lost a great deal unlike the pensioners at General Motors. In May of 2009, the PBGC met along with Treasury, Delphi, GM, and the UAW to come to a mediated settlement on the GM and Delphi bankruptcies. We were not represented, uh, evenly protecting all of the citizens of this country. They did nothing for the groups of workers, especially the salaried workers, who were considered to retaliate at the bad treatment that they planned. But they well cared for the groups that were well organized, rich, and large enough to retaliate. That is what is meant by commercial necessity. The PBGC also followed an involuntary termination process whereby they simply took over without any adjudication or outside review, thus denying us the opportunity to be represented or follow any kind of due process. Simply put, our decades of effort for the company were considered to be valueless to this administration, and so they kicked us to the curb while taking good care of their supporters, the only worker group represented at the negotiating table. In short, this administration's unprecedented involvement from the perspective of the retirees who could not protect themselves was political, illegal, unethical, and immoral. 
They had the ability to treat every worker in a fair and equitable manner, and they still can, but they refused then, and they continue to refuse to do so. The long-term effects of these decisions are horrendous indeed. According to a study by the Youngstown State University extended to include the national consequences, every year $1.6 billion of economic activity has been lost and will continue to be lost every year for the next two decades or more, clearly in violation of the requirements of TARP. Thousands of retirees have completely lost their futures. They will struggle to survive at the poverty level for the rest of their lives. The lost health care insurance on top of the reduced pensions results in many not being able to pay mortgages or put their kids through college. They have to compete for the same non-existent that so many others are trying to find. One such person is here with me today. She has to deal with several other issues, including a husband who is fighting a debilitating disease. She and thousands of others of retirees are in an unsustainable situation. Others have seen their homes foreclosed, they have had to declare personal bankruptcy, some have, had to have seen their families break up, or worse. This is simply shameful, and it must be corrected. We need to help your help to bring true transparency to this issue, to reveal for all to see the records of the agreements that helped some but excluded others. We need your help to achieve a fair and equitable settlement for all the Delphi retirees, especially the salary retirees who worked just as hard, contributed just as much, and depended on the company and our government to live up to the promises made over a decade. We are here because the administration believed that we were too weak to fight back. But this is an issue of right and wrong. It is not Democrat or Republican or administration versus legislature. We must not allow a precedent that allows the United States government to classify citizens based on their perception of political strength to stand. Nor should we allow an unprecedented uh, step to be done on, uh, on, uh, excuse me, in, in such a non-transparent manner. We will stand on this side of right, and we will fight. That is why we are here, and we need your help to win. Thank you, Mr. Gum. Doctor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am going to make uh, three points in my testimony. First, uh, government actions to restructure General Motors and Chrysler through controlled bankruptcy processes were essential to and successful in saving between one in three million jobs, avoiding a potential second Great Depression, and providing the pressure and the opportunity for U.S. firms to reemerge as world-class competitors in the global auto industry. Two, support of the UAW and other unions with ongoing relationships with GM during this restructuring process was critical to the survival of these companies and to the entire U.S. automobile industry. Further support and cooperation between the company and the union uh, are essential for GM as well as for other auto industry companies for building sustainable jobs and enterprises. Three, the specific top-up provisions governing Delphi hourly workers were negotiated as part of a complex, multi-issue, multi-party agreement governing the creation of Delphi in 1999 and again in the restructuring negotiations during the Delphi initial bankruptcy proceedings in 2006. To retrospectively signal out and renege on this provision during the 2008 and 2009 restructuring and bankruptcy processes would have materially harmed the ongoing relationship between the union and the company and would have jeopardized the industry's restructuring and rebuilding process. Let me expand on these uh, points a bit. The combined actions of the Bush and Obama administrations to support the restructuring of the auto industry is likely to be assessed by historians as one of the most important and effective steps taken during that perilous time to avoid the Great Recession from descending into a Great uh, Depression. The one to, point, one to three million jobs saved in, in, nine, in 2009 were probably expanded in subsequent years. Uh, the actions also avoided setting off a, a cascading set of costs and losses of revenues to state, federal, and local government budgets, which would have resulted from increased unemployment insurance costs of between $8 billion and $25 billion, uh, losses in GDP that would have turn, in turn reduced revenues of state governments between $15 and $48 million, billion, and reduced federal revenues of between somewhere between $59 and $170 billion. The combined effects of the uh, loan 
uh, loans and the structural adjustments and the additional concessions from workers and creditors, the leadership changes that were put in place, and in the case of Chrysler, the joint venture with Fiat, have now positioned the automobile industry to reemerge re -emerge as a world-class competitor. For the first time in a decade, the three companies are reporting profits, are e expanding capacity, hiring workers, and collectively gaining market share. I emphasize the effects of these actions on the entire automobile industry in the U.S. because of the high degree of interdependence that exists across assemblers, suppliers, and dealers. The effect of the largest firm, in this case General Motors, entering a bankruptcy without a debtor in possession financing option would have produced at best a long and uncertain restructuring process and at worst a potential liquidation of the company. Either of these outcomes would have set off a chain reaction that would likely have brought down a significant number of automobile suppliers and significantly harmed other assembly firms and even more dealers than were already harmed across the country. Indeed, it is the interdependence across these major assemblers and suppliers that has grown over the years as more output has been outsourced to the supplier base. In 1980, it was about 1.2 to 1, where uh, uh, jobs from uh, the uh, supplier base to the assemblers existed. In 2008, this had grown to 3.5 to 1. Moreover, most of these suppliers provide components to multiple assemblers. Delphi, for example, is the sole source supplier of cockpits uh, for, a ve for vehicles in the Mercedes plant in Alabama. If Delphi had been forced into liquidation, Mercedes production would have been shut down. This is only one of many examples of this nature. Ford, in particular, would have been put at risk by an extended and uncertain outcome of a GM bankruptcy because it outsources a higher proportion of its components to outside suppliers than does Chrysler or GM. Instead, Ford not only avoided bankruptcy, it used its time gained in these past several years to build a very strong partnership with the UAW that will serve as a model for the industry in years ahead. So let me speak to the role of the UAW in this industry. The survival of GM and Chrysler through these processes required the support of the UAW and other key unions with ongoing relationships with the companies. Moreover, for these companies to prosper and to build sustainable jobs and enterprises in the future, labor management relations will need to continue to be transformed, that a transformation process that began prior to the crisis. This involves not only deep economic concessions by the workforce, it also involves joint union management efforts to work together to, pull, to improve quality on the shop floor, to improve the quality of the negotiations process and to engage in consultation and information sharing processes at the highest levels of the companies and the unions. In 2007 negotiations, prior to this crisis, all three of the, the, the major companies in the United States and the UAW agreed to restructure and lower the costs of health care, of pensions for current and retired employees, and cut wages and starting salaries in ways that matched or came close to matching their major competitors. Each of these companies, to varying degrees, has also been working to engage its workers in building the kind of knowledge-based work systems that foster innovation, productivity, and quality improvements. Years of research of ev and evidence and experience has demonstrated that, that to these companies and to the union that they need to work together as partners in leading and sustaining this kind of transformation. Finally, this issue of the uh, top-off. Uh, is worth uh, some commentary. The UA and it needs to be put in its historic context. The UAW negotiated provisions to protect its members' pensions in 1999, when Delphi was initially severed off as a separate company from GM. At that point, the union recognized there was significant risk that Delphi might, Delphi might not survive. And as a responsible union, it negotiated a number of contingency provisions to protect its members and retiree benefits. These negotiations and subsequent ones that took place when, indeed, Delphi was forced to declare bankruptcy in 2006 uh, involved multiple issues, multiple trade-offs, economic concessions and sacrifices by all of the stakeholders, current workers, salaried workers, future employees, so Dr. Hiring. Hogan, I'm going to ask you to Yeah, I will I'll finish in, in 30 seconds. To signal out one provision 
to uh, the so-called top-out clause for scrutiny at this late date without considering this overall uh, package and trade-offs uh, would be inappropriate and highly counterproductive. Moreover, there is a well-established uh, provision in the Bankruptcy Code of honoring contracts of suppliers and other stakeholders with critical ongoing relationships with the company. This is exactly the case here. I will, finally, I will close with one comment, and that is this uh, statement has nothing to say about the question of fairness to the salaried employees. As an individual, as a professor who studies and works with all members, all segments of the labor force, I find it very upsetting that the salary workers were left out of this process. My testimony has nothing to say about the, the fairness or unfairness of that other than uh, what I have just referred to. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Damio. Um, thanks for having me here. Uh, I am a senior analyst at Reason Foundation, a nonprofit think tank. I have lived in the metro Detroit area for the last 23 years. I think I am the only one here on the panel who lives in Michigan and written extensively about the auto industry. As a homeowner in the area, my fate is intimately tied to that of the auto industry, and hence I am among the region's hundreds of thousands of homeowners who are ro rooting for the big three. But I don't think that the 95 billion or so taxpayers that, that, what, that the taxpayers have spent to bail out GM and Chrysler has positioned them for future success. Taxpayers stand to lose 28 to 34 billion dollars, but beyond that, there are at least four hidden costs that will plague the U.S. economy in the years and decades to come, and I'll address each of them very briefly. The first is, and in my view, the most unfortunate aspect of the bailout is that it has completely undermined the rule of law in bankruptcy. One of the main arguments for the bailout was that GM and Chrysler didn't have the cash on hand, nor could they raise it from moribund financial markets to finance a Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Hence, if the government did not step in and bail out the companies, they would face liquidation. Many experts doubt that liquidation was a plausible scenario for GM, but if it were and GM were unable to raise private bankruptcy financing, there was an argument for the government to guarantee the loan amount to private lenders, which arguably would have been a lot less than the bailout amount, and then let longstanding bankruptcy law determine how much of a loss the various stakeholders, unions, lenders, shareholders would have to suffer. Instead, this administration essentially wrote its own bankruptcy laws as it well went along, throwing out longstanding established precedent. For example, and we talked about this earlier, normally secured creditors are paid back on a priority basis in bankruptcy proceedings, but the government put unions who are regarded as low priority unsecured creditors ahead of them. The whole process was riddled with myriad examples of unorthodox practices. Such flouting of bankruptcy law essentially signals, signals to future lenders that should they loan money to politically important private companies, they can't count on the standing rule of law to protect them. Additionally, the other big uh, unintended hidden cost of the bailout is the opportunity cost. One of the ironies of the bailout is that it constitutes a missed opportunity, not a second chance for GM and Chrysler. At best, it has prepared these companies to compete with the industry leaders of yesterday rather than those of tomorrow. American automakers have been losing market share to foreign competitors even before the current recession began, and one big reason was their uncompetitive labor costs. Bankruptcy should have been an opportunity for them to significantly rationalize their obligations to labor, clean up their balance sheets, and start afresh. GM and Chrysler's post-bankruptcy labor costs are co comparable to Toyota's, which are about $56 an hour. But Toyota no longer sets the industry's cost curve. Smaller Asian firms such as Hyundai and Kia, whose labor costs are $40 an hour do. It is an open question whether GM can compete with the Kias of the future. Also, GM did not get meaningful relief from its legacy costs, something it, has, it would have under a normal bankruptcy. Without the bailout, these companies would have carried on in some form, but they would have looked very different from what they do right now. The bailout has further entrenched the status quo in the auto industry. The third big problem with the bailout is that it has unleashed a systemic moral hazard that will fundamentally weaken the America's market-based economy. 
In the two years prior to the bailout, GM had accrued $70 billion in losses, thanks to an unwieldy and bloated operation that supported eight brands. It had amassed a debt that was 24 times its market capitalization. Yet it had no cash on hand for product development or to weather a rainy day. By contrast, in those two years, Ford laid off workers, sold money losing brands, and mortgaged all its assets, including its logo, the Blue Oval, to build 25 billion in reserves that it invested in product development and for use in an economic downturn. But the bailout rewarded GM's irresponsible, reckless behavior and penalized Ford's prudent, forward-looking one. Given such precedent, any company that feels that it is too big to fail or is a national icon or is deeply enmeshed in the broader US economy or is a major regional employer will wonder whether it makes more sense for it to save for an economic downturn or hold out for taxpayer assistance. Just as the Wall Street bailout became a justification for the auto bailout, the auto bailout will become a justification for future bailouts. And the last problem with the bailout is that it has legitimized increased government management of private companies. Government help means government control, and given the goals of the bailout are not identical to those of returning the companies to profitability, it was inevitable that there would be political meddling in the operations of the companies in the name of protecting jobs, taxpayer investment, and so on. The Wall Street Journal has extensively documented what a huge role politics played in determining which and how many dealerships the companies would shutter. There are many other examples. The bailout has opened the door for, for a kind of direct government involvement in private business that makes a mockery of the constitutional scheme of a government of limited and enumerated powers. Ultimately, this might be the most damaging legacy of the bailout. All right, thank you for your testimony. Um, I'd like to just grant myself about five minutes. Mr. Eikenson, would you do me a favor and just kind of walk through the metrics of this uh, successful government intervention in the free market? And uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand because in the real world there's a different way of defining success. Uh, if you could tell me, at the end of the day, the total taxpayer investment versus the total loss. I believe there was $50 billion invested in GM, uh, and that doesn't count uh, some of the tax exemptions that's been granted. There's about uh, 12 to $14 billion in tax exemptions granted uh, to the company uh, to offset losses. It was an un 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 unorthodox provision uh, given what transpired with, with, with GM. Uh, GM also is getting um, GMAC was also kept afloat to the tune of about $17 billion, and the main reason for GMAC's preservation was to help facilitate sales of GM cars. And my understanding is that there is a, a tax credit available to purchasers of the Chevy Volt. So uh, the, the, the number that the, that the, that the public has, has grabbed a hold of is, is $50 billion, but I, I think it's probably more than that. Um, in, in November, there was an IPO, and uh, 23, I think $23 billion was raised, leaving tax uh, payers on the hook for about $27 billion, uh, and the, gov uh, the, GM still hold the government holds about 500 million shares of GM. In order to be made whole financially for that first $50 billion, the price of GM stock needs to be about $53, or the average price for selling 500 million shares needs to be $53 million. Uh, as of this morning, it's $30, and it's been hovering in that neighborhood for the past several months. Uh, and the reason it's not going to appreciate uh, substantially anytime soon is because the market knows that the, the, the largest shareholder of GM stocks uh, wants to dump about 500 million, so that's keeping downward pressure uh, on the uh, on the on the, the value. So I think uh, it's a safe bet that uh, that taxpayers will be stiffed about 10 to 20 billion dollars on that. But those those are just the financial costs. The other costs, which Sheikh and I uh, described, uh, in terms of rule of law. Um, in terms of uh, denying the spoils of competition to companies like Ford and Honda and, and Hyundai, uh, th those are other costs. There are plenty of uh, more, more difficult to observe, uh, those, those costs which are up, uh, unseen that need to be factored into this. It's not just a financial. So thing. if you could, the, the, the total figure that you come up with? Um, left right now, um, I'm assuming that there's going to be a sale of GM, and the, the average price of that sale is going to be around in the, in the 30s. So uh, taxpayers are out about $12 billion there. Then there is the tax exemptions, 
12 to 14 billion. Some of that is a direct hit on taxpayers, not all of it. Uh, and then there's the GMAC 17 billion, which is, is to my knowledge, has uh, not been, been paid back. So if you've got a pencil, I'm not going to yeah, 41. You know, I do. I'm up to 41, 41. billion. 41. And, and it's pretty similar. You get some serious money. Are yeah. We yeah. <laughs> That's right. And uh, the $7,500 credit, ta uh, tax credit for purchases of volts. I don't know whether General Electric is going to be getting uh, its major tax credit. They're, they're on the hook for 50,000. I think Jeff Imelt uh, told the President that he would buy 50,000 50, of these, uh, these volts. So uh, it's a lot of money. It's more than what we're talking about. Mr. Chairman, I will comment. comment on on I'm a Chevrolet dealer. Uh, the main purchasers of Chevrolet volts are not the American public. And I would suggest or submit to anybody that if it takes $7,500 of taxpayer money to make that car viable, that's probably not a car you really want in the market. Right. Uh, I have a bad habit of only buying cars from General Motors that I can actually sell and make a profit on, <laughs> which is, a, is an unusual concept in Washington, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may so I, 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 I will. Just one minute, Doctor. Uh, I do find it unusual. Now, we are going through the, uh, the pains of the Dodd-Frank, and I have a lot of friends from the small banks. I mean, can you imagine any bank? being able to walk away from a $41 billion loss and saying, you know what, was a great investment. Only in this beltway do we come up with these type of metrics, and I think it is absolutely astounding that we can say that with a straight face. Uh, and, as, and as far as the American uh, car company recovery, uh, are we also taking credit for the disaster in Japan? Because a lot of those cars would have been sold here had they been able to be produced. Uh, and, and I think that we are really we are making a very unstable argument for the recovery process. Uh, Dr. Koken, you want to make a comment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the $41 uh, billion is a, is a good uh, number to use uh, as the uh, uh, total costs, but you have to balance that against two things. First, just the numbers on the low end of the savings of unemployment insurance and other government expenditures, the loss of revenue that would have resulted to State and local governments and to the Federal Government, at the low end of all of those estimates from three different sources comes to $82 billion. And so you will get really a, a one to two. But your uh, premise is based and, on the idea that General Motors would have failed completely had it gone in its General Motors, that okay, I, I don't think that. I, see, I don't, I don't well, buy that. Long, a long, un, unstructured bankruptcy would have had substantial costs, yeah. and that is the low end. The liquidation costs would have been a factor of about five more than that. That is liquidation. This is only a long, uh, uh, unstructured. Uh, uh, now, the second thing that has to be considered here, and you know this as, a, as a, an experienced person in the industry, the, the, the cascading effects across the industry would have been devastating, not only your dealership, but many, many others, not only Delphi, but many other suppliers, not only GM and Chrysler. Ford CEO testified that he would, put, he would see his company at risk. So you're, we're, I, we have I, to take an industry perspective here, not just I, I agree with my colleagues on the panel. We are not in the business of saving specific companies. We are in the business of protecting the American economy, I understand jobs, that. communities, and the, the future of the industry. And that is what was at and, risk. And I, I appreciate, I appreciate the, the model that you are speaking of. But Thank you. I think there would have been some survival of General Motors at, at some level. So a lot of this is purely academic. No, uh, it is not Delmi. purely academic. Mr. Chairman, let me finish. No, I will come back to you. I will come back to you. Mr. Delmi has a You know, just to put this uh, question of metrics in some context, uh, Toyota and Honda have lost 2.5 percent of their market shares between January and May. Out of that, 1.4 percent of that market share has been picked up by Hyundai and Kia. Uh, and our automakers, the big three, have picked up 0.8, out of which a bulk of it is by Ford, which is a non-bailed out company. So the $80 billion, or however much we have spent, has gone to protect about 0.4 or 5 percent 
of the market share of GM and Chrysler. I just find it hard to believe that, Chrysler, uh, that GM would not have survived to capture that kind of market share at this stage in the game, you know, when car sales have been going up a little bit. So, you know, I mean, these are all counterfactuals, but I agree with uh, Dan that if we are going to credit uh, GM and uh, Chrysler for saving jobs, then we also need to take the cost to the broader economy of the jobs lost. The very fact that the UAW's uh, pensions and their wages have been protected more than at a competitive level suggests that we have fewer jobs in the economy because the per worker cost of these workers is really quite high. If we were paying them a little less, we might have had more jobs, in fact. Yes, and I, and I can appreciate that. And, but I, as I said earlier, the whole purpose of the hearing today was for the American public to actually understand where their tax dollars went. And there is an argument on both sides, and I do understand it. Uh, but I do think uh, a lot of what we are talking about, and one of the things I don't understand, is we are willing to say that that is something we can write off. Why, uh, maybe somebody can explain to me, why is this unrecoverable? The losses that we're projecting, I know as an independent person, if I borrow money, I'm actually responsible for the whole amount. I'm sorry, you're asking. Wh well, we're, we're we're saying we're given that I, I think that we're that, willing to to no, write I don't think off. Anyone, as anyone's a, willing. I think I think uh, Mr. Eikenson explained it. The real issue would be if the stock value rises to the level to recoup the full investment, then you would get it. But we can't control the stock market. I think that is where the losses come. I think the direct loans have been paid, and there was a debate about you know, where those dollars where those came dollars from. Came I understand from. that. Right. The loans will be repaid or have been repaid. It is the, the loss on the direct investment may come if, as, uh, if the current value of the stock stays the same. I think that is the situation. And, and, I, and I, I would go back to the original purpose of the hearing today was to talk about the government injecting itself into a free market and, again, making whether, whether we determine right or wrong, that is for the American people to determine, was their money spent properly? Mm -hmm. Was it spent the right way? And at the end of the day, did it do what it was supposed to do? And a lot of it, there is differing opinions on both sides, and I can appreciate that. But I do know one thing. At the end of the day, every single penny came out of the taxpayer's wallet. And that is my main concern. And I, I just have this undying belief that free markets really do determine where we are going to end up and things are going to rise and fall depending on conditions, which we don't really have an ability to do. And there is nothing more dangerous than trying to, project, to, you know, to figure out what the future forecast, what the future is going to do. Things do change, and they change very rapidly. In this, in, and I know in the automobile business, what looks like a really smart move one day can turn around very quickly. A little thing like Katrina blows in off the coast and all of a sudden gasoline that was $2.39 or $2.49 goes to $4.09 in a market that was one time stable goes completely upside down. So there's unforeseen things in the future. Yeah. The question really does come down to the investment in taxpayer dollars and the benefit. And I think there is something to be said on both sides. And yeah. having said that, and I know it's been a very long day, I really do appreciate you appearing here. And in the future, I would appreciate also if you weigh in and let us know, because it is really important to the American people to understand this process and how their government does make decisions and the consequences of those decisions. So I want to thank you for appearing. And with that, we are going to adjourn. Thank you.